I'll tell you, it's a pleasure and an honor, really an honor to be here with you and to deliver this message. Uh, like Richie said a couple weeks ago, I delivered a message similar to this. When I was uh, at the mission trip in the Dominican Republic, I delivered a message. They asked me to, this, that was the first time, and, and I thought about it, nah, it really wasn't the first time that I've done something like that. Because when I was in the military, I used to be an ordained lay leader. I just thought about that. I'm like, wow, yeah, I remember going through the classes and, you know, a ceremony and all that. And, and, and I got a chance to, to talk to folks in the Navy and, you know, and all that. So that was really cool. And uh, I got to put my password in. There we go. So anyway... Um, I changed the message up a little bit, and the reason I did that was, uh, first of all, it was in Spanish, and I mean, if we have some, some with, uh, you know, that know Spanish, or some folks with charismatic or Pentecostal backgrounds, like, oh yeah, he's talking in tongues, you know, yeah, it's a different tongue, and I'm sure my wife, Angela, would probably be able to interpret it, so yeah, yeah, no doubt, uh, but uh, so that, that's what it's going to be. We're going to start by reading from the Word of God. And is it up there? Put that first scripture on, please. There we go. Uh, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is for the Jews. Think about the woman in the well and all that. And at that time, you know, they had that, you know, that, that big deal, worship in the mountain or worship at the temple and all that. But this is what's important of the scripture. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. How many times have you heard that? Worship in spirit and truth. Until I started doing the research and I went through the scripture, I said, like, that's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came alive, you know. So like I said, uh, here's the thing. God created us to worship him. <laughs> right? I mean, look, it's in your DNA. You know, you've seen the thing on Instagram and all that where they talk about, you know, the, the numbers of the links between your whatever, whatever's in the spirals of the DNA and all that, and they spell the word Yahweh, right? And the thing is, you know, it's in our DNA to worship God. And here's the thing. It is in our DNA to worship, period. Here's the question. Who do you worship? You know, you can either worship God or you can worship some other God that you create, whether it be your job or maybe your family or that nice shiny set of golf clubs you got sitting in the, you know, it, you know I, I don't need to go to church, man. It's really nice out there, a little chilly, but I can get a, you know, a round in. And that becomes your worship. You know, look, here's the thing. Nothing makes Satan happier than when you come up with some reason or some other God, right, to take over the right position of our Father, right? Not only does that violate the first commandment, but pretty much I think it violates every commandment that's out there, you know, plain and simple. And I mean, sure, we can enjoy you know, nature, I mean, I look out there, this is one thing that I didn't realize, Richie, how you go out there, you look, and I'm, I'm waiting to see some deer running around, or, you know, but the thing is, all those things are temporal, God is eternal, so that's the first thing we need to think about, you know, God made those things, the ball games, the golf games, the, you know, the nature, the fishing, the hunting, all that. He made that for us, not to replace him. So that's what we need to think about, okay? 
<coughs> Speaking of worship, worship is not about copying others. And we have so many talented people out there, right? We listen to, you know, contemporary Christian music on the radio, you know, Plug for Caleb and, you know, Air One and all that, folks that have great radio stations. Some of the others that are out there, you know, like Life and I think it's called Life Worship or Life something in, in, in Macon or something like that. Great, great radio stations. We got some talented people here. I mean, we had Chib and Matt, you know, and, and I don't remember your name. Our, our drummer, right, uh, did a great job, you know. And, and uh, you could say, like, wow, man, I wish I could play like that. Or I wish I could sing like that. Or do you see somebody on TV or YouTube or a video, Christian music, you're like, they're so inspired. I want to be that. You know, here's the thing. It's great. It's great to wish we could do that, but always remember, God created you as an individual, all right? Uh, that's not what worship is. Worship is something that should be unique to you. So let it build in you. Let it, you know, just get into you and make it your own. That's the first thing. Isaiah says, uh, Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and our God for, and to our God for he will freely pardon. Bottom line is turn to him. You, that's what we need to worship. Worship the one who created you. Worship God. So I'm, I have a, some points Richie, I learned a lot by listening to Richie and, and, and other pastors out there. Points are good, right? Gives you an outline, something to, like an anchor to, to hold on to. Um, first point, worship is not a one-time event. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly Speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. The key words there are at all times and constantly. Constantly. At all times. We are to worship God no matter what the circumstance we may find ourselves in. Keep that in mind. All right? There is really no special time to worship. Well, <clears throat> here comes 1030, and I don't know I'm going to have, uh, you know, the, the team coming up, and they're going to play music. That's not the only time you worship. Amen. Worship at all times, all right? And it's not just in church or when you go to your quiet place at home or, or prayer room or what. Yeah, you know, I love, I, I love like, like Richie, because Richie does the same thing. And, and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I grab a cup of coffee in the morning, and I grab my Bible, and I read Scripture, and I meditate on God's Word. And I talk to Him. You know, Angela's not there. She's, uh, you know, probably still dozing or something. It's early, right? And, and, and here's the thing. It's my time to have a cup of coffee with God. And it's my time to worship him. Because I woke up that morning. Trust me, when you're 70 like I am, that's a plus. <laughs> All right? Uh, so we need to worship always, whether it by words or deeds. Worship is not just speaking out and saying, Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. It's not that. When you see somebody out there that needs help or you see somebody out there that is sick and maybe they need, you know, you'll see all the, the meal trains come up and all that. When you participate in that, that is part of worship. So it's, it, you worship in word and deed, okay? And look, I don't know how many here maybe of K 
charismatic or Pentecostal background and all that. And, you know, those of you that know me, I'm Catholic, right? I mean, we, that's what I love about this church, right? We can have different backgrounds. But I'm, I'm one of them crazy Catholics because I'm Catholic charismatic, right? So I have learned that when I don't have the words, I let the Holy Spirit come into me and speak the words. So plain and simple, you know, plain and simple. So if you don't have the words, it's like, God, send your Holy Spirit. Give me the words I need and just pray. Look, in Scripture it says, sometimes with groans and mumblings and whatever, fine. God will understand what's in your heart. He sees your hearts, okay? So, all right, here's my favorite. My favorite point, point number two, worship is warfare, right? Worship is warfare. No matter what you are going through today, and golly, we, haven't we gone through a lot of things this year? And we see things that are still going on, right? No matter what, God, as you worship, will satisfy your needs. You ain't going to win the lottery unless you play it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, no, here's the bottom line. It's not about me, 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 God, give me, give me, give me, give me. God will touch your heart, all right, and satisfy your needs that way, all right? I like this. I read this in, in I, I do a lot of devotionals on the YouVersion app. I, I wrote this out of that. It says, God is a friend on whose shoulder we can cry. He is there to listen to our problems and bring on resolutions, not according to Jose's will or Angela's will or Richie's will, according to his will. Right? You know, Chip... And Matt, you know this, right? We, we sing, we still sing the song every once in a while. It's written by Jonathan David Helser, his wife, Melissa, Molly Skaggs, Ricky Skaggs' daughter, okay? Uh, and Jake Shepard. And it's for Bethel music. It's called Raise a Hallelujah, right? And when you read verse 1 in the chorus, it says, verse 1, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah greater than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is my melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. And then we go and see the chorus. And it says, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. And that is a great song. We need to do it. Some, we need to do it again. You know, and it's been around for a while. It's a song that has been around. So now, if we keep reading uh, in Scripture, Psalm 18 says, I love you, Lord. You Lord, are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress. Golly, think about that. My castle. I can hide in there, you know, with all the ramparts. When you think about a, a fortress, right? The ramparts and the moat all around it. Man, I think it's pretty cool, right? He is my savior. He mans those ramparts for us. God is my rock in whom I find protection. The power, that's, uh, the, the power that saves me in my place of safety. David, when he wrote this, recognized what God was for him. Man, David went through some bad stuff. Saul wanted to kill him. One of his own kids wanted to kill him. It's, like, it's bad stuff. But David recognized who he needed to turn to. All right? And we keep on reading on, on this psalm, uh, Psalm 18. Uh, it says, David continued on further on down in the psalm, says on, starting with verse 30, 
God's way is perfect and all the promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Right? If you read some of the Hebrew texts, I like reading the complete Jewish Bible because it'll say something like, who is W, I mean Y for Yahweh? Remember, they don't say that except for Adonai. But who but who but our God is a solid rock? Nobody. The golf, the set of golf clubs, the briny, brand new shiny ride out there, right? The brand new house. That is not your rock. Those are blessings from God. God arms me with strength and he makes my way perfect. He makes me short footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on mountain heights. Chip, you hunt, right? You see deer out in the woods and they get up on the top of the hill and all that. If they weren't sure footed, they can you see them running? If they weren't sure footed, they couldn't do that. Here comes part of the boot camp. He trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow. You have given me your shield of victory. Your right hand supports me. Your help has made me great. If that is not training for warfare, I don't know what is. Right? God is all-powerful. When we lift our knees to Jesus and we lift Jesus in our worship and praise, he intervenes. You know what's good about that? That battle is no longer yours. Jesus took it over for you. Right? And, and, and I think, to me, that's what, you know, what's really cool about it. Because a lifestyle, a lifestyle of worship is a life in authority. Knowing that as we worship and praise Jesus, we host the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is mighty in battle and who trains us for war. Where do we host him? We host him in our worship and in our prayer. He's with us, right? Regardless of what giants you may be facing today, pray, worship, give it to God. He's your sustainer and the lifter of your head. He is your shield and your strength. He will help you in the battle. Why? Because he listens to you. I mean, how many here have kids? If your kid comes and asks you for help, don't you listen to them and help them, right? I know I do. Sometimes you want to choke them, and you want to say, yo, dummy, why'd you do that? Regardless, I still listen to my children, you know. Thank God they're grown, but now i got to deal with the grandkids and the great-grandkids. <laughs> all right. It, why, is all, why is that warfare so critical? Because as it says in Ephesians chapter 6, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Look. Look at what's happening in society today. Tell me it's flesh and blood only. No, it's not. We're fighting against evil rulers and powers and principalities and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. So put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then... After the battle, you will be standing firm. That armor is our worship. As we cover ourselves with the worship, we're putting on the helmet of salvation in the sheet, in the sword of, of uh, faith. And, oh, I forget what. <laughs> I'm, let me not go there because I'm digging a hole deeper. No, no. <laughs> All right, so that's the key thing. Now, he said, you know, look, look at Jose. He's walking around. You know, look, I'm trembling like a leaf, but I'm okay. I teach for a living. I've, I've taught for a living before this, so, and I spoke. So it's okay. But I'm glad Richie let me wear his headset because I'm Puerto Rican with a lot of European blood, and I got to use my hands to talk. If I, if I don't use my hands, you know, I'll be, you know, I, I can't sit there grabbing on the, no. Uh, so you know why? Because I have learned that worship is emotion. Right? Worship is emotion. So, when coming to the Lord in worship, don't hide your emotion. 
be genuine, dance, cry, dump, shout with joy. I've seen that happening over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm going to caution you. Never, ever, ever, really, mock anyone who does it. And vice versa, don't mock those who don't. Because everybody worships their way. Okay? Some people are very comfortable. Woo! Jumping and skipping and all that stuff. Oh, that hurt my, my fake knee. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, here's the thing. If we read in Scripture, 2 Samuel 6, starting at verse 20, when David returned home to bless his old family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust. I can just see it. I can, I can picture it like a movie, right? How distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself. Remember, David was dancing around naked. Right? Huh. To the servant girls, like a vulgar person may do. I, I can see that. You know? <laughs> that, that old finger. Yeah. But I love David's answer. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord, not before them or you or anyone else. He said he was shamelessly dancing before the Lord, who chose me, and here's the, the barb, I guess, I don't know, right between the eyes. I just said, punch him in the throat. He chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as leader of Israel, the people of the Lord, so I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servants, servant girls you mentioned will indeed think, I am distinguished. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childish throughout her entire life. Why did I caution you? Michael was David's first wife. She mocked and chastised David, chastised David because he was coming into town, celebrating, bringing the ark home and all that into the temple, and dancing before the Lord in the streets of Jerusalem. And she never had a child. She became barren. So don't mock. The worst sin that we can commit is a sin against the Holy Spirit. Really. Right. And it's not just about dancing, joyful praise. Powerful emotion gets to God's heart. Like, like no, no powerful emotion gets to God like a good cry. It really does. Crying before God is part of a lifestyle of worship. It gives us the strength to say, I can't do that on my own. I remember when my daughter Danny was diagnosed with breast cancer. I got that call. Angela and I, we got that call. We cried. We cried. Right? My child with cancer? That's tough, right? I remember going into my quiet place, and you know, as, as all was going on, and I knew she had already started her treatments, and there were going to be surgeries and all kinds of stuff. And I remember all that, right? But I went into my quiet place, and I said, you know, God, I need your help. And I started listening to a song that was popular back in the... Uh, the two, it's, it was actually written uh, by Mark Hall in, in uh, Bernie Herms from uh, Casting Crowns in 2005. But it was has been in, in the radio, in, in contemporary uh, DCM radio for a long time, right? Many years after. I sang the chorus with that. I remember back, I had the CD. Everybody would say, well, you probably got a cassette, old man. No, I don't think they had cassettes. <laughs> but no, I had the CD and I put it on and I, started, and I sang. I was singing that song. It's a very powerful song, okay? Um, I cried. I was on my knees, sobbing, crying to God. And you know what? When I finished, I looked up to him towards heaven, I knew that God had his hand on Jenny. Plain and simple. It's like the thought that came into my mind, the thought that came into my mind was, it's going to be I. 
you know? So that's the key thing. Now, I trusted him. You heard my cry of that, I'm sure. I've played it simple. It says in Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. What do we do with that joy? That my heart may sing your praise and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. All right? And for the tech move, we're going to skip the, the, the because we're a little running a little behind. So we're going to skip the course. Don't worry about it. So let me read a scripture. They don't have it. I got it. Habakkuk 3. You familiar with Habakkuk and what was going on and all that, right? The, 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 it's, it, things were tough. Things were tough. The Israelites were experiencing the wrath of God to say, at least. And Habakkuk, the, the prophets wrote this, or the, the, whoever, his scribe or something, wrote this. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on, on the vines. They had the fig tree. They just didn't have the figs. They had vines. They just didn't have the grapes. Though the labor of the olive fail, they had the olive trees, no olives. And the fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Stalls were there. They were just empty. But what's important here? Verse 18. Yet, with all that that's going on, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on high hills. Let me introduce you. We see that picture that we had. I'm going to introduce you to this group. And I apologize ahead of time for the folks on live stream, because this, we couldn't get it to go into live stream. Uh, these are the hamricks. When we lived in Virginia Beach, we lived in a covenant community. These were one of the families. They're, they're one of the families that are still there uh, in that covenant community, the Hamricks. And uh, great family. They're, the, patriarch, the patriarch is all with the blue scarf on his head. That's, that's Uncle Gary. That's what my girls call him. Okay. Uh, look, if there are some people that exemplify the verses I just read... It's them. One of their sons, Matthew, don't ask me to point him out because I probably wouldn't recognize him right now. Uh, and his wife, Kim, they adopted a child. They were happy. They were great. Everything was going well. All of a sudden, the birth mother says, I want him back. And they had to return the child. But that didn't stop them. They didn't give up. They adopted two other kids after that, right? And then Kim got pregnant and had a baby. And you're like, wow, what a great story. Things are going well. The baby died of sudden death in syndrome, infant sudden death syndrome. And then to make things not really better, but, you know, it, things happen. Life is life. Kim was diagnosed with cancer, very aggressive form of cancer, stage four, metastatic, something or other, or whatever. The bottom line is that she passed. So now Matthew is a single dad with two kids, you know. But when you meet Matthew and we see him, he's got God's joy in him still, right? Um, his brother, Ben, got married. They got, a ton, they got a ton of kids, you know, good Catholics, right? Uh, his wife, Christy, has been fighting a, also a very aggressive breast cancer for years now. The battle still goes on, right? The kids are there, right? What, the reason I have this picture is because in this picture, in the middle of that war, this is not a battle, it's a war. In the middle of this war, 
Look at how they're all dressed up. You know what that is? This was this past December the 24th. Right? They're all, what are they all dressed like? Shepherds. And, and one of them is probably, they're holding baby Jesus. And, you know, they're shepherds and all that stuff. And you know what? That's what they do. In the middle of that war, they take the time and celebrate Jesus. They celebrate Jesus, right? Gary, the patriarch, you know, and thank God Angela and, and, and Robbie, and they're, they're okay. Their, their, their family is still okay. You know, just some, bat some battles going on in that war. But Gary, he was the patriarch of that family, said that they have always, through all of this, felt the goodness and the love of God on their family. You know what? It's their choice. They can either mope and blame God and woe is me, or they can just celebrate the love and goodness of the Lord. And that's what they chose to do. That needs to be our choice, right? Worship. Point number four, and this is the last point, is more than a song. When we think, oh, we're going to worship. Woo, we're going to sing some songs and we're going to have fun. And let me tell you, I love music. You know, today was great, all those old hymns and all that. You know, I, I thought it was great. Worship is more than a song. Worship is, worshiping is not just singing a song or a melody. It's not playing an instrument. It's not about the lights and the laser shows and the fog and, you know, a great audio. Recently, I finished a devotional written by Thanga Selvam. Thanga Selvam is a worship leader from Mumbai, India, right? Uh, and he said that worship is about you. Worship is the posture of our heart, bowing before God with an attitude of giving him priority and glory in our lives. So what is worship? Aligning our thoughts and hearts to God's will for us. That's what worship is. So, and you know what? It's great to worship when things are going great. You know, man, look at my new ride. Woo! Yeah, look at these new golf clubs. And, wow, look at all this clothes I got for Christmas and all that. You know, that's great. You know, I got accepted to the college I wanted to go to. Man, that's fantastic, right? Thank you, Jesus! But you know what? When things don't go that way, think of the hamricks. We still need to worship God. I mean, just look around, and even in our own congregation, people have lost loved ones. People have gotten sick. People are taking care for chronic, chronically ill people. Injuries, diseases. But they're here, and they're praising God. You know, it's all well. Worship is a very powerful and effective tool to bring through, break through to your situation and need. It redirects your focus toward, on God, towards God, okay? Worship makes the enemy scatter. Look, you read in the Bible, every time the Israelites went to war, who was leading the pack? Who? Who? The band, yeah, the singers and the band, they were up front because it scared the bejesus out of their enemies. They scattered. They're like, these folks are loco, you know? <laughs> we're going to go fight with swords and shields and spears and all that, and they're coming up singing? Uh-uh. I want no part of that. Worship is a testimony to those around you, especially when they know what you've been going through. And they see that joy of God in you, you know? I mean, look, when we see in the book of Acts, and we see Paul and Silas in jail, and they just got their butts whooped by the jailers and what have you, and, and they're in chains, and yet they are in that cold dungeon and all that. And what are they doing? They're singing praises and worshiping God. All of a sudden, here comes the earthquake, and, you know, to the point that that jailer says, I want what you got. So it is a testimony 
It is a testimony. Sing praises to the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Amen. Weeping may stay the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. All right? So we sing praises to God. Express it. You know, it's not just the song. It's everything. It, look, it is a lifestyle. Okay? I like... I like what the Amplified Bible says on this one, because if you look at the NIV or New King James and all that, it's kind of short. The Amplified Bible on Psalm 22 says, but you are holy, oh, you are enthroned, the holy place where the praises of Israel are offered. All right? God in Habits. You are enthroned. God inhabits the praises of his people. Right? Now, let me give you some, as we wrap this up, some judicious words to offer here. When we enter his presence, we are going from the mundane to the holy. We are going from the earthly to the heavenly. Always keep that in mind. The writer of Hebrews says, we are entering the church of the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Jesus Christ. We're entering the church of Jesus. This should be a place of reverence and holiness, not something that we should take casually or lightly. That church is filled with saints who have gone before us, with choirs of angels in continual praise, with the elders surrounding the throne of God, this place, God the Father, Jesus His Son, and the, His Holy Spirit are present. Man, what a congregation. <laughs> you know, I remember sometimes when we, when we were at Strong Rock, it was great, but things started dwindling and all that, and, you know, and, and now I'm glad to see it's, it's coming back. But you know what? No matter what, we could have had three people there. But we still had a great congregation. All the angels and saints that are there, right? Um, as we worship, we come uh, and pray. We come into the presence of the Most Holy Yahweh, our Father, Jesus, His Son, and our Redeeming King, and the Holy Spirit, who enables us to boldly, not arrogantly, enter His holy place. We worship the Spirit and truth. We said that at the beginning. We worship in the company of saints and angels. We worship in the holy of holies because of what Jesus did for us. The sacrifice of the Lamb enables us to do that. We should always be in awe of God's presence. Augustine mentioned it in his works. We should worship with what's called gravitas, which is Latin. For gravity comes the word. But it's not what he's talking about. The weightiness of the presence of God. Lord, it's just on you, right? Amazing. We worship. I heard this. I thought I'd put some smart words in here, right? We worship in communio sanctorum. Latin for in unity with the saints. Our worship ascends the throne of God together with that of our brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus himself is the mediator of the new covenant, much like Moses was at Mount Sinai. And it says uh, in Hebrews, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. Like I said, what a congregation who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than that of Abel. And we have talked a lot about worship, you know, <clears throat> and I want us to think about this coming year. We do prayer every Wednesday here. It's worship. It's not just coming here. We want to have you here, of course. 
if you can make it. But look, worship in words and deeds, in your actions, okay? Approach God's throne with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Now, I love this. I showed this to Richie, and I got to chuckle out of him. Be immersed so much in prayer and worship to a point that this summer, when that mosquito bites you and draws the blood out of you, he goes around flapping his little six legs and flapping his wings and says, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Right? When that mosquito goes away. Or he could also be going out there saying, oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Let them, let, so that's what it should be in you. Worship should be in you always. 